Today, I am talking with Dr. Sophie Janica Balls. She is a positive media psychologist who investigates the role that social media and traditional media play in promoting well being. Her research and teaching focus on positive psychology, media, and new communication technologies and mindful communication. She currently holds the position of associate professor at the School of Communication, Communication at Chapman University and is director for research at the Digital Wellness Institute, where she applies her expertise in research on digital communication and well being to develop programs that help workplaces and educators digitally flourish. So that's an impressive bio. Thank you and welcome. Thank you so much for having me. And I just wanted to start quickly by underscoring that um, while our mission really is to educate kids on digital wellness uh, issues, um, being mindful of adult use is incredibly important as well as some of the latest re research shows, which we're going to jump into. So today we're going to focus on adults. Um, so let's start with, with that question about the research. So what does the latest research show about screen technology use as it relates to mental health? Yeah, um, well, there is actually a lot of research that does look at adolescents or young adults when it comes to this big loaded question. And um, to just kind of give you a bigger a review scope of really what we know today is the thing that we see in the news media that you know the social media is ruining um, everything right very very uh negative a uh, view of of this technology we actually don't have data on that so when we look at anxiety and depression then the research suggests that there might be small effects um, because it very much depends on the individual the individual adolescent or the individual user itself um, it's really hard to make these big brush strokes um, to claim this causal relationship, which we see in the media all the time. Um, and we have data that, not much, but we have some data that does investigate this causal relationship. Um, but when we, when we really look at that, that causal relationship so far, if we look at it in this linear way, is rather small because it just depends on so many factors. It depends on the device, the, the app that's used, how much time we spend with it, what content we consume, who we are as a person, and so what we see in terms of a pattern is that if there are already issues that a person has, and that can be obviously developmentally, if we think of adolescence as a very challenging time, then the use of, of particular social media apps, um, and yes, we can think of specific ones like TikTok, even though we don't have direct data on that, but we can speculate that that like TikTok or other social media, if, it's, if they're used very extensively, can enhance the problems that are already in place. But in terms of the social media necessarily just causing out of nowhere um, high levels of anxiety and high levels of depression, while that may be the case for some in terms of an overall brushstroke, this is very hard to say. Now, however, when we look at body image and um, kind of this body dysmorphia and self-esteem issues, there we do see um, a small to medium effect in terms of social media use um, and those body image, uh, negative body image effects on young adults. So there we actually do see some data suggesting that. Um, and so it's right, it's already important what we talk about when we talk about mental health, certainly body image is part of that but it would now be different from depression or anxiety. So these are just kind of, you know, some, some small brush strokes here of a topic that we obviously could talk about for at least a day. Yeah, I, I really like that balanced answer and a couple things stood out. And one of them was um, sort of speaking about childhood or adolescence is almost like a pre-existing condition, right? Because we know that um, brain development is so rapid at this point. So um, I thought that was an interesting insight there, the way you, you put that. Um, okay, so my next question has to do with a, a buzzword that I think is thrown around quite a bit, which is a digital detox, right? So um, let's talk about it in the context of adults. So when should adults consider taking, let's, let's have you define it first, what is the digital detox? And when should adults consider taking one? 
Yeah, again, right. The, I love that the question of well, what's defined at first, because really that might de depend on the person. A digital detox can be for a person to not use their devices for a day, it can be to completely detox for two weeks on vacation and really only use your phone for some text messaging, but you opt out of email, right? Then already it becomes like, oh, I'm detoxing out of something specific. So, uh, <laughs> It, you know, it, if we if we look at how the research looked at it and really did studies where people digitally detoxed, they generally basically didn't allow people to use any of their social media. Um, and so what we see there is very much mixed results um, in terms of effectiveness. It, we can think about it with a diet metaphor that this right, we're very extremely just dieting on, on one thing. Um, a lot of times has this yo-yo effect and it comes back, right? And we're actually not changing a habit on the long run. And so it depends on what you want with a detox. If you really just want to relax and reset yourself, um, just like going out in nature and just relaxing, then this is certainly something that anybody should do when they feel the urge to do that. But when we think of a detox as a solution to a bigger problem of changing a habit and the way we use our technologies or a particular app, then it's actually not so beneficial. So it really depends on what we want from this detox. And if we just really want to use it as a reset, like going on vacation, then it's almost like we can listen to our self-awareness and see, okay, when, when do I need this? And then to take one. So what would be some of the signs maybe for somebody to know, hey, I might need this? Yeah, totally. I mean, uh, any form of feeling of, overwhelmed, feeling tired, almost from a physiological standpoint, uh, you know, tired eyes of looking at the screen for too long, having trouble sleeping, falling asleep, um, if there are issues kind of related to that, uh, that you can't really let go of your phone, you have to have it with you all the time. So kind of a little bit of the dependency issues, these would probably be signs where uh, maybe a little bit of a reset in terms of that detox would be really helpful. Okay. That's really, those are good signs, good little tips to look out for. Um, so the next one's a loaded question. Can people truly multitask? Yeah, I love that question. I actually uh, talk about this in my classes all the time. And the simple answer is no. The simple answer is we cannot do two things at the same time when it comes to the way we look at technology, right? And this is probably almost we should not talk about multitasking, but really media multitasking. We really can't uh, write an email while, while being on a Zoom call and listening and understanding and hearing everything. Now, can we multitask in terms of certain physiological actions like riding a bike and talking? That's multitasking too. And yes, absolutely, we can do that because we're using two different parts of our bodies or brains in that, in that sense. But when we talk about media multitasking, we really can't do that. And it's one of those things where in this day and age, we feel like we can and we feel like we get more things done that if we just quickly write an email and then on the back end, we're listening to a YouTube video or a lecture and we can just do it all and, and get it all crammed in and are going to be faster uh, done with our tasks. That's actually an illusion. There's some simple um, little tests we can do to see how much longer it actually takes to do two things at the same time. And also how more often we're um, mistake prone. So we make more mistakes when we do these two things at the same time. And so in the school context or university context, this can show up as actually us not remembering anything from the class we were sitting in while we were texting or while we were online shopping. Um, in the workplace, right, when we're trying to write an email, but again, being on a Zoom call at the same time, we are not being able to actually comprehend or remember a lot of the detail of the Zoom call, or we make a lot of mistakes in writing the email. Um, and it actually takes longer. I have my students a lot of times actually do a little bit of that detox <laughs> as a practice where they're not allowed, where they're only kind of allowed to use their phones for they're not allowed to multitask, basically. They're just supposed to use their phones for, for texting and just getting things done. But otherwise, just do that one thing at a time, just do their homeworks and be done with it and not use their phones while doing it. And they find across the board, all of them, suddenly they have so much more time in the day. They realize they have two hours more time because they get their homework done faster. They were able to relax faster at night, fall asleep faster. 
um, and just had, yeah, so such a, a positive uh, impact of what they thought is actually a thing that's helping them by right? doing two things at the same time, but it's uh, very much of an illusion. Yeah. And I mean, just from my knowledge about it is, isn't it because your brain is actually switching quickly between exactly. tasks? Isn't that yep. why um, exactly. your brain really mm -hmm. does need to focus on one thing at a time? Yep, exactly. Yeah. And then we get cognitively overloaded. So our brain just yep. uh, can't comprehend anything anymore. And then we can't store the information in our long-term memory and all the yep. issues that come yeah. from that. And then another thing, I don't know if you've heard this statistic, it was from, um, if you're familiar with that stolen focus book, it was uh, pretty widely um, read, but uh, there was some, uh, I think a very surprising statistic in there, which was it takes 23 minutes to refocus mm. once you've, and I think he was talking about a deeper state of focus, obviously, right. but yes. um, I mean, that statistic, because I know you work with businesses and um, students like, like mm -hmm. you're talking about, I mean, that's just staggering in terms of like the time loss that must mm -hmm. add up, right? When you're trying to work that way. Okay. Yeah. So let's talk about focus, which um, again, probably a loaded question, but do you think we're seeing in a, de a decline in the ability to focus and let's just stay with adults for now or young adults? Yeah, no, absolutely. We do see a decline and actually um, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, the Digital Wellness Institute, we interviewed Gloria Mark, who wrote a book that's called Attention Span. And she is also a professor at UC Irvine here in California. And she actually did uh, research across uh, decades and was able to realize how our attention has declined to right now being an average of 47 seconds long. That's how long we can focus before we already start thinking about something else or are distracted. So that comes then this, this point of distraction where the problem of new technologies comes really in is with that focus because we get pinged from our email, our phone, a message, and that wires our brain to not being able to stay focused on one thing for a really long time. We do self-interrupt a lot too, so it's not only outside sources, but certainly with the advancement of the technology that we have today, there is a lot of that interruption happening from these from these sources, from these tech sources that decline our focus. Absolutely. And uh, what was the? Did you say forty-seven seconds? Forty-seven was seconds, correct. I, I think I read somewhere it's as much of a, as a goldfish. Is that true? Yeah, the goldfish. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, we touched on focus and multitasking. Um, so how, let's, I guess, zoom out a little bit and talk about how technology affects productivity in the workplace. You've touched on a few things here and there uh, on the distraction level, but um, yeah, how would you zoom out and talk about that? Yeah, um, technology at the workplace and, and really in a lot of areas of life, it really depends on how we use it. So it can absolutely be a big distraction and prolong the time it takes for us to complete a project or even um, complete it with high quality and, and being caused by a lot of the distraction. Us not having the skills or motivation to manage the technology so that it doesn't interrupt us. Um, right, manage the way we actually work and get some deep work done so we can actually problem solve, really solve the big problems of the world, right? In order to do that, we need more than 47 seconds. We actually need to focus uh, for long periods of time. And so technology can certainly be hindering for that, but it can also be helpful. Um, and that's something that a lot of times is overlooked because obviously we always like to look at the negative things. And so I like to also point out that our phones can be obviously a big source of connection that gives us a, a good feeling while we are maybe at work and feel safe if we're able to connect to our loved ones uh, in between deep work sessions. If we have been able to kind of schedule uh, schedule our work in a way that's actually productive and not get interrupted right by our technology, it can be a source of entertainment and relaxation. It's something that's overlooked, right? We, we think of, we always just come home, even if it's a remote work, we, we get off work, right? We, we uh, lounge on the couch and, and watch our favorite show and therefore relax. This is something we do now on a regular basis on our phones as well. We watch short video content um, and this can be a, a form of relaxation if we feel entertained by it. Now, 
then it becomes right a slippery slope because if we get sucked into it and suddenly it's 45 minutes later and I actually just wanted to get entertained for five minutes to kind of get a positive boost here of dopamine, um, then that is again where self-regulation becomes uh, a problem and and we have to think about how to manage that. But if we manage it well, then it can actually be a nice source to um, help us focus, to help us relax, and therefore be productive at the workforce. Okay, so in the form of entertainment, like what you're describing, you're you're talking a little bit about recharging, right? So that <laughs> by the time you go back to work, but in the context of work, <clears throat> it's more the distraction that's the issue. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so let's pivot to higher ed, which I, I know you teach, and uh, Digital Wellness Institute also works with higher ed institutions. So how does technology affect learning on that level? So these are older adolescents, but their brains aren't fully formed yet. So just putting that into context. Yeah, and again, um, here I would say in generally the same answer, it can be helpful and can be uh, hindering, right? Hindering again from that distraction standpoint of multitasking in the classroom, which is an absolute norm right now, um, where we have to really uh, teach uh, and set basically values and a culture where, where students realize that that is actually not beneficial. Um, but what can be beneficial then again, um, and students talk about this too, they realize that actually is using te their technology to actually get deeper and again, learn more information about the subject matter that they're talking in class at, a, at that time or a professor talks about. So a lot of students actually Google things in between lectures or in between seminars to get a better understanding. And that is something where classroom engagement is actually enhanced through technology. Um, and so it's just something where even the, the instructors now have to relearn of how can we actually leverage the technology so that students get more engaged and actually learn more than just it having be a distraction. And you mentioned earlier almost having to teach your students about uh, this idea of, of focusing. Are you finding that kids are coming in with just sort of like uh, a blind spot in, in that part of things <laughs> yeah that's yeah that for sure that um if we think about it right i talk about it we actually never learned how to focus nobody actually taught us how to focus it's something that's kind of expected of us once we start school but we never actually are taught any strategy of what that might look like and what that might feel like in our brain um and so this is something we yeah have to learn and have to talk about so that students then also can realize Oh, okay, so here we go, right? Here's my brain getting caught up in other stuff and or I'm getting externally um, distracted by this notification. Let me do something about this and let me actually use the technology to not get um, distracted by a ping, a notification. Let me put my phone away for 20 minutes and then I'll take a break and I'll check it again, right? Being more intentional in the way we use our technology is something um, I think that could solve a lot of problems uh, where obviously technology is designed to not make us necessarily think intentionally about how to use it, but that's really what we have to do in order to derive the benefits of it. It seems like just hearing you talk, once you do bring awareness to it, it seems like your students are receptive. Yes, absolutely. It's really a lot of it is an awareness practice in uh, making them realize, oh, I actually, I never thought about this or, oh, and I didn't realize that I do spend this amount of time on my phone and I actually don't like it. Or it's like, oh, I actually realized the time I spent on my phone, I do like, and I don't want to miss it because these are the benefits I derive. So it's a lot of that awareness practice and intention setting. Interesting. Okay. So my last question is, um, has to do with what I think everybody in this business is, is talking about right now, which is AI. Um, I don't know if you've seen any effects of it already inside the classroom, but how do you think the deployment of AI, which is happening very, very rapidly, is going to affect um, both the workplace and uh, higher ed, which is you work mm -hmm. in both categories? Yeah. Um, well, when we talk about this AI, we talk about right the, those language programming, artificial intelligences um, like ChatGPT or 
uh, of that nature. And I think, again, it's what we make of it. Uh, it's an inevitable evolution of where technology is developing now. And there is certainly this understanding that now we have another tool that can automatize certain works that have been done previously by people. So in terms of kind of that workforce uh, issue, that's certainly something that that can be an issue. In terms of um, higher education, again, I don't think ChatGPT is substituting a university. We still need people that actually have an understanding of what to do with the knowledge, structure the knowledge and uh, and help us uh, guide us in in what to do with it right but i think again it can be a great tool to get more engaged to get uh thoughts ideas to for project or for whatever it might be i think what it doesn't do and that's what we have to con really keep in mind as educators is it can't substitute critical thinking no way i will will take that away we still have to learn that and that's what we have to teach in schools, in higher education to make students really understand what critical thinking is, how to apply it. And then I think they, the, those types of AI can actually be beneficial. Yeah, I mean, it's just like all the rest of it, right? It can be a tool or it can be uh, helpful or harmful, right? So depending yeah. on how you use it. So yeah. I don't envy you having to um, navigate all this though inside of- Oh, it's fun. I love the yeah. challenge. It's really great. You'll always learn from the students. Um, and, and so it's a really creative and collaborative and, and exciting time, I think. Good. Well, that's, I love the optimism. Um, <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time and everything you do. Um, you know, whether it's educating the young people who are working with Digital Wellness Institute. And um, I, I loved all your, your very balanced answers. I think that's really a great way to look at all this. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to, to talk to you. Thank you so much. Take care. <laughs> thank you.